This is looking at the male reproductive system. It is a combination of both exercise 42 and 43 combined together. This is a side view showing the reproductive organs of the male. As you can see, you have got in the scrotum is where the testes is located. This is where the sperm is going to be produced. And then you have the ducts known as the ductus deferens or the vans deferens which is a tibule that goes from the testes. It will proceed up over the urinary bladder, around behind it, through the prostate gland, down through the penis to expel the sperm out of the, the body. The penis, its purpose is to deliver that sperm into the female reproductive tract. There's three regions to it, the root, otherwise known as the bulb, the shaft, or the body, and the glands penis. <coughs> Excuse me. On this diagram, it is showing the bulb of the penis uh, towards the back, the glands penis on the end, the root, or the shaft is in the middle. The precipice, or the foreskin, is on the very tip of the penis. This is what is surgically removed during circumcision. Uh, this is fairly common in the United States, newborns to have circumcision done to remove the precipice or what's often known as the foreskin. The reasoning behind it is that it would reduce the risk of infection because around it, if it's left on, the epithelial cells can shed their moisture and it becomes a very warm, moist environment for bacteria to grow. Uh, there has been recently more and more controversy about it because some people feel that there is not a medical reason for doing this, that it's more just by tradition, and it does cause undue pain to the baby. It becomes basically a personal choice as to uh, if you have a son, whether you wish to have him circumcised or not. The testes is the primary male sex organ. The function of it is to produce the sperm cells and then also to produce the uh, male sex hormones, the testosterone. As you can see here, the testes is located in the scrotum, which is basically the sac uh, just behind the penis. As you can see in this cross section, it is divided into different lobes or lobules. Each one contains seminiferous tibules. That is where the sperm is actually going to be initially produced. And then from there, it will travel uh, through the tibule to the reddit testis and then leave the testes in moving into what is known as the epidermis, of which there's different sections of that. There is the head at the top, the body, and then the tail. And then the whole time the sperm is uh, maturing as it is moving through this entire ductwork. But it is initially formed in these seminiferous tibules in the testes. There are additional cells that are located there to help nourish those developing um, sperm cells, help to regulate it. And then also there are cells that are producing the uh, male sex hormones. During development, typically the testes are going to move out of the abdominal cavity into the scrotum at about seven months of the development of the um, fetus. Sometimes the testes do not completely move down out of the abdominal cavity, especially in the premature uh, birth. With time, they'll usually watch. With time, they will eventually migrate. If they don't, a surgery can be performed to move the testes down into the scrotum. If they remain in the abdominal cavity, the problem is um, the individual could become sterile. For normal sperm development, the internal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius is too high. And so that's why the testes are in the scrotum outside the main abdominal pelvic cavity is because it's a little bit cooler temperature that allows for the normal development. 
Once again, you can see here the seminiferous tibules. See how they are in each of the lobules, and then they all congregate at the red testis, and from there we'll move into uh, the efferent ductile up at the, the head of the epididymis. Epididymis is the um, structure, it looks like a cup around the testes. The function there is to store the sperm. Um, it's the sperm is still maturing, it's passing nutrients to it. As they continue to move through this, this high network of tibials, they will eventually gain the ability to swim. So you can see how it tends to wrap around the upper portion of the backside of the testes, still in the scrotum area. And then it will connect to the ductus deferens or vans deferens, which then runs up into the pelvic cavity. The function of this is to transport the sperm during ejaculation. And if you look here, you can see how the ductus deferens, or sometimes called the vans deferens, does extend up the scrotum. It will cross <coughs> over the pubic bone cross on top of the urinary bladder and around to the back side of the bladder. Keep in mind, obviously, there are two testes. So from this view, you can see uh, from each one, there's a separate von Stefferens. Now, the spermatic cords are helping uh, to secure the testes, hold them in place. They have to pass along the abdominal wall there's some weakness that can be associated with this. And then sometimes in a guanal hernia, what happens is when um, a hernia is when a portion of something moves into a location where it's not supposed to be and you get a bulging. And in this case, part of the small intestines can protrude or move into that canal and move down into the scrotum. There would be a bulging there. It would need to be corrected by surgery to move the small intestines back into place and try to strengthen around that canal to prevent it from happening again. The von Stefferens essentially becomes the ejaculatory duct. It's going to pass uh, through the prostate gland. Once again, the function is to transport those sperm during ejaculation. And as you can see here, uh, that ejaculatory duct is indeed passing through the prostate gland. Now the urethra is going to converge with the ejaculatory duct um, and then form the, the main urethra from that portion on. There's three regions of the urethra, the prostatic urethra, as the name implies that is where it is passing through the prostate gland, the membranous urethra, and then the spongy or penile urethra is that is the last, the spongy urethra is that is, that is uh, passing through the penis. The purpose of the urethra is to uh, allow transport of both urine and the semen, obviously at different times. So here you can see <coughs> The prostatic urethra is after that ejaculatory duct has combined with it. So you can see uh, that would be carrying the semen, the sperm, with the associated um, nutrient uh, fluids with it. And then, as you can see, from the urethra from the bladder would join at this point. The accessory glands, there's three of them, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bubble urethra or cowper's glands. These three glands are producing um, the secretions that combine with the sperm to form the semen. The seminal vesicles, they are found uh, on the posterior side of the bladder and it joins with the ductus deferens. It is secreting most of the uh, volume of the semen. It contains uh, fructose, sugar, various enzymes, various fluids, and it's more alkaline based. It's going to help with the motility of the sperm and help with fertilizing, uh, fertilization if it should occur. 
<laughs> so we saw, as you can see here, the seminal vesicle is basically located between the bladder and the ampule of the ductus deferens, and you can see they join, um, the ductwork does join together to form then the ejaculatory duct. Below the bladder uh, is the prostate gland. It does encircle around the urethra. Uh, it is going to secrete a slightly acidic fluid. It is going to have, contain enzymes that will help activate the sperm, and it will uh, also secrete the PSA, which is the prostate-specific antigen. So as you can see here, it is below the bladder. It is surrounding uh, the ejaculatory duct is, goes through the prostate gland, joins with the urethra, and the prostate uh, surrounds the urethra and the ejaculatory duct. Some clinical uh, applications. BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, is non-cancerous tumor that what happens is basically you have an enlargement of the prostate, and when it enlarges, it constricts that urethra, making urinating uh, very difficult. If there's problems with the urination, that means the urine is retained in the bladder. That can lead to urinary tract infections. It can then lead also to kidney stones. So what type of treatment would be done? Well, typically you're going to do something either uh, by medication, uh, trying to initially reduce that tumor, or you may actually surgically remove the prostate gland. Prostate cancer. Uh, also has the enlargement of the prostate. It also is going to constrict that urethra. Um, there may not be in early stages any symptoms, and then as you start to develop symptoms, it would be things such as decreased urination, more frequent urination, but with less urine output because the enlarged prostate is basically pinching on that urethra. If it is not detected in time, it can metastasize and cause secondary tumors and lymph nodes nearby in the pelvic bones and the lumbar vertebrae. One test that they will do is what is known as the PSA, that prostate-specific antigen. Typically, that number becomes elevated if an individual has prostate cancer. So ideally, if you have a PSA test done, and they often recommend for men uh, about 50 years of age or older to start having a routine PSA test done and to monitor, and you want that number to be as low as possible. If the number is high, they would do more tests to uh, diagnose whether it is a benign tumor or is it actually prostate cancer. And there's various treatment um, options that they can do, such as radiation or, once again, removal of the prostate gland. The third accessory gland is the bubble urethra or the Cowper's gland. This is a very small gland. It's below the prostate. It is going to secrete a very thick and uh, clear mucus. That's going to drain into the spongy urethra when a uh, man is aroused sexually. It helps to lubricate the gland's penis and it will neutralize uh, any of the acidic urine that may be, have trace amounts in the urethra. The sperm has three different parts to it. It has the head, it has the neck, and it has the tail. The tail is the flagellum. Uh, the neck is where the DNA is going to be uh, contained in. On the tip of the head is the acrosome, which contains enzymes that will help that sperm to be able to penetrate the egg during fertilization. This is one picture showing uh, microscopically what sperm looks like, as you can easily see the flagella on it. Here's another picture. Spermatogenesis is the process of producing the sperm. This event occurs in the seminiferous tibial of the testes, as we already said. It starts usually around roughly age 14, and it will continue for the rest of a man's life.
a healthy adult male typically will make every day about 400 million sperm. So unlike females, which at birth only have a set number of eggs, males will, once again, they start about age 14, but then for the rest of their life will make sperm. The process of spermatogenesis um, is through meiosis. There's two types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis. Meiosis only occurs in the production of the sex cell. So it only occurs in the production of the sperm, which is spermatogenesis, or in the production of the egg, which is oogenesis. And roughly from this table, what I want you to realize, if you look at that, uh, at the top, you have the initial stem cell that's going to go through mitosis, which produces two cells. One of those will remain as a stem cell to continue the process of uh, producing new daughter cells. The second cell will move on down, as you see, and become the primary spermatocyte. It will go through meiosis, which is a two-step process, meiosis one and meiosis two. We are not showing all of the steps here. The bottom line is that you will end up, from the initial one cell, you will end up with four sperm. In each of these, if you notice the two end versus just the single end, that's referring to the number of chromosomes. It will have half the number of chromosomes of the uh, original parental cell. And that's fine because um, if fertilization should occur, the oocyte also just has one set. So if fertilization occurs, the two nuclei will fuse together, and you'll be back to two copies of everything. But spermatogenesis, which is that production of sperm, uh, the bottom line is you will end up with four new sperm cells.